for centuries, there were fearsome tales of a half-human monster roaming the African forests. Even in modern times, knowledge of the elusive creature, the wild chimpanzee, was largely based on speculation. Then, in 1960, a daring young Englishwoman set out to sort fiction from truth. She had been warned, you'll never get near the chimpanzees, but she was determined to try. Her name, Jane Goodall. She was 26 years old and destined to make scientific history. Against odds many thought insurmountable, she gradually earned the chimpanzee's trust. The picture that has emerged is an awesome portrait of the animal's most like man. The similarities to humans are startling. The obvious physical resemblance. The discovery that they hunt and eat meat. The even more profound revelation that they are intelligent enough to make and use tools and in their non-verbal communication, perhaps the most uncanny resemblance of all. Meticulously documented on motion picture film, Jane Goodall's classic study stretches from 1960 to the present day. A compelling chronicle that spans three generations of chimps, it is the longest study of any wild animal group in the world. Unexpectedly, one of its recent chapters took a forbidding turn. The usually gentle, amiable chimps revealed a dark and sinister side, puzzling, savage behavior as yet unexplained. And so the saga goes on, the remarkable adventure of the wild chimpanzees and the dedicated woman who works among them still. Growing up in Bournemouth, England, Jane Goodall was drawn to the world of animals almost from the start. When her mother gave the infant a chimp doll, outraged friends predicted nightmares. They could not have been more wrong. Even when I was very tiny, I was absolutely fascinated by animals. I think I first began to dream of going to Africa after reading Dr. Doolittle and Tarzan when I was about eight. I was absolutely fascinated with the idea of being out in the jungle, out with the animals, feeling a part of it all. Famed anthropologist Louis Leakey had long searched for someone to study wild chimpanzees for clues to the behavior of early men. I want someone unbiased by academic learning, he said. Someone with uncommon patience and dedication. His faith in Jane Goodall would lead to one of the most important scientific studies of our time. Her journey would take Goodall to the East African country of Tanzania, then known as Tanganyika. The remote Gombe Stream Game Reserve stretches for about 10 miles of rugged mountainous country along the shore of Lake Tanganyika. And so on the 14th of July, 1960, Jane Goodall was 4,000 miles from home a tiny boat, her only link to the civilized world. When I arrived at the Gombe Stream Reserve, I felt that at long last my childhood ambition was being realized. But when I looked at the wild and rugged mountains where the chimpanzees lived, I knew that my task was not going to be easy. Day-to-day -day life in this remote wilderness would be difficult at best. The local authorities, horrified at the thought of a young white woman alone in the wild, at first refused Jane permission to come, agreeing only when she said she would bring a companion. Aside from her mother, Van Goodall, and an African cook, Jane would spend the next several months virtually alone. It was already late afternoon when the tents were pitched and provisions stored. 
But after 20 years of dreaming of this day, Jane was eager to begin. Unarmed and untrained, she ventured into a strange new world. For most, this would be a lonely, forbidding realm. But for Jane Goodall, it was where she most wanted to be. During my first days at Gombe, I could hardly believe it was true. At last, I was out in the wild. I didn't see many animals, but I had the feeling they were there all around, watching me. There were rustles in the undergrowth, strange calls, smells I could not identify. For months, the objects of her search invariably fled at the mere sight of her. Often she couldn't find them at all. It was a steep, rigorous climb to the open ridges above, but perhaps, she hoped, a way to pinpoint the nomadic apes below. I discovered, not far from camp, that there was a peak overlooking two valleys. And from this vantage point, I was able to gradually piece together the daily behavior of the chimps. The major advantage of the peak was that the chimps could see me sitting up there and gradually get used to my presence. Sitting quietly in the same spot day after day, always dressed in the same neutral colors, never attempting to follow the shy apes, the figure on the peak gradually became less of a threat. It would be some time, however, before Jane was accepted at closer range. Though the chimps now recognized the intruder, her intent was far from clear. Jane had to accept the realization that, for the time being at least, much of her knowledge would be based on indirect evidence, like an abandoned sleeping nest high in the trees. Jane found the nest was not simply a pile of wadded leaves, but a carefully interwoven platform created by dexterous hands and a reasoning brain. But the intelligent creature who made it had long since moved on. Impatient with her slow progress with the chimps, Jane stretched each day to the final rays of the setting sun. This would be her first meal in 12 hours. It had been another long and frustrating day. As I am not a defeatist, it only made my determination to succeed stronger. I never had any thought of quitting. I should forever have lost all self-respect if I had given up. And so, days that began before dawn reached well past midnight. And for as long as it would take, tomorrow would be the same. Even when there were no chimps to be found, there was always much to be done. Samples of plants the chimps eat would be preserved for later identification. There was a new language to learn, tribal customs to absorb. A makeshift clinic helped cement good relations with the local villagers. With camp life settling into a comfortable routine, Gombe increasingly became Jane Goodall's private world. Though her staff was growing, outsiders till now had not been welcome, lest they frighten the chimps. But at Louis Leakey's urging, she agreed that a permanent film record of the chimps be made. To shield herself and the cameraman, she built a blind, a screen of leaves. Hugo van Lawick is a specialist in wildlife. Primarily funded by the National Geographic Society, over the coming years, he and Goodall would capture details of chimp behavior never before dreamed possible. They found that chimpanzees are nomadic, traveling in ever-changing groups in the daily search for food, wanderings that can take them two to six miles in a single day. Oh, my God. 
They are animals of dramatic extremes, noisy and excitable one minute, calm and gentle the next. To satisfy their hunger on a diet that is largely vegetarian, chimps eat up to seven hours a day. Much of their diet is fruit, but they also feed on leaves, blossoms, seeds, and stems. After congregating at a food source, several individuals may rest and groom together, then separate once again. The only stable group within the community is a mother and her young. Males take no part in child rearing. Contrary to common belief, chimps do not have fleas. Mutual grooming does remove flakes of dried skin and grass seeds, but physical contact for its own sake seems to be the primary goal. Not much interested in quiet pursuits, youngsters have better things to do. The chimps very gradually came to realize that I was not dangerous after all. I shall never forget the day after about 18 months when for the first time a small group allowed me to approach and be near them. Finally I had been accepted. I think it was one of the proudest and most exciting moments of my whole life. Chimpanzees are as distinct from one another as are human beings and Jane gave them names as she came to recognize them. Old Flo, with her bulbous nose and ragged ears, is matriarch of the family Jane would come to know best. At seven weeks, infant Flint is still completely dependent on Flo. Flo's adolescent son, Figgin, plays with his younger sister, Fifi. Even fully mature Fabian often stays with the family. Ever since Flint's birth, his sister Fifi has been fascinated by the baby. Repeatedly, she tries to touch and groom him. The older chimps, less interested in babies, tend to ignore Flint. But Fifi is persistent, actually trying to take the infant from Flo. Though protective of her newborn, Flo is never rough with Fifi. When she's had enough, she simply walks off, leaving Fifi looking rather frustrated. <laughs> Another group's arrival is signaled by a chorus of hooting calls. Adult males dominate chimp society and are much preoccupied with their position in the hierarchy. In an effort to better his rank, the male puts on an awesome charging display. With hair bristling and vegetation flying, the male makes himself appear larger and more dangerous than he actually is. Intended to intimidate rivals, it is usually nothing more than superb bluff. After displays of aggression, the dominant chimp often reassures those who have been frightened or hurt, and thus tension is diffused, harmony restored. One male rose to the top of the hierarchy by intelligence rather than strength. Mike discovered that rolling empty kerosene cans from Jane's camp made a horrifying noise. A 
originally one of the lowest ranking males, Mike was now number one. Close to where they are feeding when dusk falls, the chimpanzees will build sleeping nests for the night, 30 to 40 feet up in the trees. After choosing a suitable foundation, such as a horizontal fork, the chimp takes only three to five minutes to bend down branches, then twigs, to create a comfortable padded bed. With creature comforts long since forsaken, Jane found increasing pleasures in her wilderness world. But, as she soon discovered, human creature comforts were not without appeal to some. A chimp had wandered into camp and found the supply tent where bananas were stored. Because he had been to camp before, when Jane was in the forest, she had a prearranged signal to call her back. It was thrilling after all this time to find a chimp actually in my camp. It was David Greybeard, a male I had already come to know out in the forest. David's boldness marked a turning point for Jane. After the endless months she had searched for them, the chimps, following David's lead, now came to her. Gradually, their inherent fear gave way, and an offer of friendship was accepted with trust. If she could lure the chimps into camp regularly, Jane realized, her observations would be far more consistent than chance encounters in the forest. Bananas were the answer. The scheme was not without its flaws, as the local baboons quickly proved. David Greybeard repeatedly ran to his friend, the more powerful Goliath, for protection. Goliath came to David's defense. But the baboon knew which chimp was afraid, and it was David he went for every time. Because of the trust established in camp, tracking the chimps in the forest was now much easier for Jane. She was able to follow and document in detail the development of Flo's infant son, Flint. At six months, Flint is learning to ride on his mother's back. But sometimes he doesn't get it quite right. At around the same age, he takes his first tottering steps. When he stumbles and whimpers, Flo quickly rescues him. Flo is a particularly affectionate, tolerant, and playful mother. And because much maternal behavior is learned, she is the role model for her daughter Fifi. As Flint grows older, Flo permits Fifi to take him for brief periods of time. Such experiences provide important training for the future when young females mature and have offspring of their own. About the time Flo begins to carry Flint on her back, Fifi tries to imitate Flo. Though unsuccessful, the attempt marks an important milestone in her learning experience. Mandy is a young female who has just had her first baby. Fifi has never seen the baby before and is intrigued. 
for the moment at least, this is something more interesting than Flint. As Mandy settles down, Fifi comes for a closer look at this newest member of the community. All youngsters at Gumby are interested in new babies, but Jane had never seen one who showed more fascination than Fifi. A study in concentration. Mandy is not worried by Fifi's presence, but when adolescent male Figgin approaches, she nervously moves off. Both Fifi and Figgin are fascinated by the smell of the new baby. Fifi has followed Mandy up a tree and now attempts to touch the baby. Mandy gently fends her off. Meanwhile, even Flint is curious about another infant younger than he. But Flo is ready to move on in search of food, and she lets Flint know it is time to go. Fifi, still engrossed with Mandy's baby, does not notice that they leave. When she finally looks for her mother, Flo is out of sight. At six, Fifi is still quite dependent on her mother and cries in distress. She has no idea in what direction Flo has gone. Flo would come at Fifi's cries, but apparently can't hear her above the growing storm. Although chimps seem miserable in the rain, surprisingly they make little effort to find shelter. Even in a torrential downpour, they just sit and wait it out. Long committed to observing the chimps seven days a week, Jane ignored the rain. Searching for the lost Fifi, she saw something remarkable instead. The male Goliath performing a spectacular display. Enthralled by the magnificent rain dance, Jane would later write, with a display of strength and vigor such as this, primitive man himself might have challenged the elements. 20 minutes later, the rain dance was over as suddenly as it had begun. Among Goliath's audience, Jane spotted Flo and Flint. From her tall lookout, Fifi saw them too. Strong family ties, temporarily broken by the storm, were once again intact. The rainy season brings the flight of fertile winged termites as they leave their nests to establish new colonies. For chimp and baboon alike, they are a tasty delicacy. But baboons can only capture the termites outside the nest as the swarms emerge and fly. When they have gone and worker termites have resealed the nest, the baboons will move on. But the chimps not only know termites are there hidden below the surface, they have learned how to get at them. In defense of their nest, the termites grip onto the grass, and with utmost care, the chimp gently draws them out. As a stem becomes bent, the chimp breaks off the end to make it work more efficiently. 
Sometimes a leafy twig is selected, but first it must be stripped of its leaves. In these actions, modifying natural objects for a specific purpose, the chimp is not only using, but actually making tools. It seems certain that this is a learned behavior, passed from generation to generation by watching and imitation. Flint does not yet know how to fish for termites, but already he imitates part of Flo's technique. Jane's proof that chimps make and use tools would rock the scientific world. Tool using always used to be considered a hallmark of the human species. When Lewis Leakey first heard about tool using at Gombe, he got extremely excited and said, now we have to redefine man, redefine tool, or include chimpanzees with humans. A chimpanzee brain will never design a computer, nor even imagine a durable tool chipped from stone. But his brain is more similar to our own than is that of any other living creature. And surely it was thus that our distant human ancestors began, learning to master the natural world in the constant struggle to survive. To a thirsty chimp, rainwater trapped in the hollow of a tree is inviting but not easily reached. Once again, the chimps have learned to solve a problem by fashioning a tool. Wadded leaves act as a sponge. Chewing makes them more absorbent. Using the sponge, the chimp can get as much as eight times more water than with fingers alone. Inherently curious, youngsters like Fifi learn from older chimps, and thus the technique is passed on. Baboons at Gombe outnumber the chimps by about four to one. For the most part, the two species coexist peacefully. But the baboon is a competitor for food, and friction can arise. Because he has the intelligence to use a weapon, yet another type of tool, even a youngster can intimidate a fully grown male. The bluff works. But, as Jane would find out, sometimes the aggression is very real. A young baboon has been captured and killed by a group of chimps, and they will feast on its remains. Jane's discovery astounded the scientific world. The chimp is not the gentle vegetarian we had thought, but, like humans, a formidable predator. Sometimes cooperating to hunt and stalk their prey, they also kill young antelope, bush pigs, and monkeys. For the most part, chimps eat meat only they themselves have killed. Indeed, a dead animal is often a puzzling sight. Right With Gombe's growing fame, visiting students and scientists became a regular part of the scene. One day, as part of a project to record chimpanzee calls, Jane put out bananas in great quantities. The result? An eruption of frenzied excitement, desperate begging, and violent aggression. Because of the excessive hostilities aroused, Jane disapproved of such human intervention. But the episode was not without value, revealing the intricate patterns of chimpanzee dominance and submission, and the chimp's intense need for reassurance by touch. The sounds of the encounter were carefully analyzed by students specializing in chimp vocalization. 
With the passing years, Gombe drew students from around the world with interests ranging from biology to communication to psychology. They came because of Jane and the unique opportunities of the living laboratory she created here. To avoid future aggression over bananas, Jane devised a system of rationing by remote control. Now the chimps were fed only if they arrived alone or in small groups, and then just once in 10 days. Apparently not happy with this new state of affairs, the ever-creative chimps made their wishes known. In 1966, tragedy strikes. An epidemic spreads from a nearby village, and Gombe awakes to the devastation of polio. Nothing that has happened at Gombe before or since has been as horrible, nothing. They were among the darkest days of my life, a living nightmare. The worst tragedy was old Mr. McGregor. He lost the use of both his legs, and he could only move by pulling himself along the ground by his arms. The other chimps were frightened by this strangeness and shunned old Gregor. Only his close relative Humphrey stayed nearby. The mother, Ollie, has lost her month-old infant to the disease. Though she knows he is not alive, she carries his dead body for three days. Polio vaccine is flown in and fed to the chimps in bananas, but for many it is too late. Flo's son, Fabin, Paralyzed in one arm, protects it by walking long distances upright. To get food, Mr. McGregor had learned to pull himself into trees with the strength of his arms alone. But he dislocates a shoulder while trying to climb and now can no longer move at all. Jane knew she had but one choice. Her longtime friend must be shot. But 1967 would bring joy. Married three years, Hugo and Jane now had a son. Little Hugo, nicknamed Grub, would grow up in a world most children never even see. Spending less time at work to be with Grub, Jane modeled her behavior after the patient, affectionate chimp mother she had long observed. Gombe was the ideal place to raise a child, she said. You could focus on the important things in life, family, unity with all living creatures, being part of the natural world. As she watched her own son grow, Jane continued to track the development of Flo's son, Flint, who was now four and a half. Pregnant with her fifth child, Flo was increasing her attempts to wean Flint. Typical of youngsters his age, he resisted, still trying to suckle and demanding to ride on Flo despite his large size. When denied his way, Flint threw violent temper tantrums, even hitting and biting his mother. Perhaps because she was too old to cope, Flo often gave in 
and let Flint have his way. Later, this would have grave consequences. Later that year, the baby was born and Jane named her Flame. Still attached to the placenta, Flame was just a few hours old. Because females give birth only every five to six years, a newborn always stirs much curiosity among the youngsters. Jane wondered what the birth would mean to Flint. Flint's behavior would be expected to change with the new arrival, but instead he was getting worse. Even after the birth of his sibling, when most youngsters become more independent, Flint continued to pester his mother for attention. And more often than not, Flo gave in to his demands. Even with flame at Flo's breast, Flint sometimes tried to suckle. Six months later, while Flo was ill, Flame disappeared, never to be seen again. With no baby to care for now, Flo stopped even trying to encourage Flint's independence. Jane wondered if he would remain an infant forever. Life expectancy of a wild chimpanzee is guessed at 40 to 50 years. Flo, now well past 40, was feeble and worn spending most of her time resting quietly near Flint. Although I knew that Flo had become very old indeed, it was still a sad day when I found her dead body lying in the stream. For me, it was like losing an old friend. For Flint, it was like losing his whole world. Flint stayed by himself, close to the place where Flo had died. He ate very little. He became increasingly lethargic and depressed. And finally, in this state of grieving, he grew sick. Three and a half weeks after losing his mother, Flint died too. Today, the name Jane Goodall is almost synonymous with animal research. Accomplished author, speaker, and now a PhD, she is sought all over the world. A rarity among scientists, she has become a celebrity in her own right. He wasn't having it at all. He wanted to follow his adolescent brother. Wherever she goes on her annual lecture tours, eager crowds gather to hear the latest chapter in the lives of the chimps. Any new, particularly new developments, new behavior, attempts? Two quite interesting new developments. One is concerned with territoriality. Though she welcomes the opportunity to share her world, Jane keeps her visits short. Gombe is where she most wants to be. With her on this trip are her mother, returning for a nostalgic visit, and Grub, now 15. Though not even Jane could have predicted her study would last this long, it is 22 years since she first set foot on Gombe shores. In that time, the country has gone from British rule to independence. Gombe, once a game reserve, is now a national park. But friendships that span more than two decades remain unchanged. <laughs> Today, permanent structures have replaced Jane's lakeshore tent, 
and a staff of 10 Tanzanian field assistants has been trained to help observe the chimps. The men work in teams of two and follow the animals seven days a week. In recent years, they, along with Jane, witnessed a startling turn of events. Like Gombe itself, the chimps, it seemed, had changed too. If I'd left, as Louis Leakey predicted, after 10 years, we would have had a very different picture of the chimpanzees to that which we have today. People's idea of the gentle, noble, savage would have been exemplified by the way of life of the chimps. I started off studying one community, and in 1972 that community divided into two and one part of it moved down into the south of the range that the whole community had shared. Two years later, a series of events began which were amongst the most horrifying that we've seen at Gombe. The males of the larger Kasakela community, the ones that we're studying today, systematically began to hunt down individuals of the smaller southern community to attack them when they found them on their own or in small groups. And within a four-year period, every one of the seven males and at least one of the three females who had moved to the south had disappeared. The sequence of events that occurred during this warfare were really shocking because these attacks were not over in one minute. They lasted 20 minutes. They were gang attacks where between three and six adult males together attacked one victim. The victim was rendered senseless, virtually crouching on the ground, not even trying to fight back. And yet they would pound him, they would drag him, they would bite him, they would smash him. One of them had a broken leg, one of them had a great piece of skin ripped from his thigh. And these were very, very brutal attacks. And I think it's a bit horrifying to consider that just because we now know how aggressive the chimpanzee can be, this makes him even more like humans than I thought they were before. Only because Jane stayed on at Gombe was the warfare discovered. Only because she remains there still may it one day be explained. While the male gang violence was a profoundly dramatic event, much of Jane's work continues to revolve around the subtle intricacies of day-to-day -day family life. Her observations of Flo and Flint taught her just how powerful a mother's influence can be. In the 10 years since Flo died, Jane has followed her family into its third generation. Flo's daughter, Fifi, is now a mother herself. Like Flo, Fifi is an extremely playful and tolerant mother. Her son, Frodo, bears a striking resemblance to his dead uncle, Flint. Young Fanny evokes images of Fifi herself as a child. And in adolescent Freud, a visible reminder of Figgin as he matured. Gwenna now watches Frodo, getting much more active than he used to be. As she watches Getty, the youngest member of the Gombe community, secure in his mother's arms, Jane reflects on ten other infants who, over the course of four years, met a gruesome fate. There was one extremely horrifying day. I was in Dar es Salaam, and we were contacting Gombe by radio, as we used to do every morning. And this strange message came over, that the adult female Passion and her adolescent daughter Pom had seized a newborn infant from Gilka. Gilka, one of the polio victims, a chimp I'd known since she was one year old. And that this mother Passion had killed the baby, and she and her daughter and her son had shared the body between them. And I found this almost impossible to believe, but when I got to Gombe a week later, it was indeed true. And over the next four years, 
Passion and her daughter Pom were known to kill and eat three newborn babies. They were watched as they tried but failed to catch two more. And we suspect that in that four years, in fact, they were responsible for the deaths of ten newborn babies. Jane had always described Passion as a somewhat unnatural mother, cold and indifferent, indeed often callous to her youngsters. Yet Jane could not possibly have predicted that Passion would become a killer, attacking with aggression so violent that she paid no attention to human observers even when they tried to intervene. Why did they do it? I really have no idea. I suspect that it was an aberrant behavior shown first by the mother, imitated by the daughter. It was perhaps the hardest thing to understand and to accept that's ever happened at Gombe. And the descriptions of the attacks on these mothers are some of the most moving and horrifying descriptions that have taken place in all the 22 years. For instance, when Passion, together with Pom, two strong females, attacked Melissa with her three-week-old baby, Melissa's daughter, Gremlin, much younger than Pom, ran over to the two field assistants who were watching this horrifying struggle, stood upright, looked into their eyes, looked back at the scene, and really seemed to be begging for help. But Passion and Pom were strong, stronger than Melissa and they managed to seize the baby, leaving Melissa terribly badly wounded. The moment they had the baby and had killed it, when Melissa went up to watch as they ate it, Passion reached out, embraced and kissed her, as though, I have no quarrel with you, I wanted your baby, now I'm content. And as I say, we just do not understand this behavior. Hopefully now the behavior is finished. Passion is dead. Pom has shown no signs of doing this and indeed on her own isn't capable of attacking another female and stealing her baby. For now, the warfare is over. The cannibalism has ceased. Gombe is quiet again, but for the eternal sounds of the African night. Then, on a summer evening in 1982, a joyous chorus of human voices pervades the dark. An anniversary party celebrating 22 years of research at Gombe. To share this night, some have come by boat, others have walked for miles. With traditional feasting and speeches, they join together to toast the future and celebrate the past. Well, after 22 years, I have many, many fond memories of Gombe. Perhaps the one that I like to think back on most was after having struggled, crawled through the undergrowth, climbed up to the peak and down again and searched, and been rewarded, yes, by seeing chimps, but chimps that ran away every time I went up to them, to have a chimpanzee just sit there and watch me and know that I was there and not mind. That was a very, very wonderful moment. It was a tremendous feeling of accomplishment and exhilaration and pride in the fact that I'd been accepted. And then a rather different kind of memory was the first time that a wild chimpanzee mother came up to me and allowed her infant to reach out with that wondering expression in his eyes to touch me. And that, of course, was Flo with her infant, Flint. And that's another moment I'll never forget. And though it often seems a lifetime ago, she remembers them all. Three generations of chimps who allowed her the privilege of entering their private world. Wild animals roaming free, who permitted a human to live among them as a friend. Today, the direction of the study lies uncharted ahead, to be written by the chimps themselves. 
It is a future Jane Goodall embraces with anticipation and a personal dream. I hope to stay at Gombe for as long as I can struggle around the mountains. And even after that, I would hope that I can train somebody to follow in my footsteps so that when I'm old and doddering lady, I can still hear about Melissa's grandchildren and Fifi's successes and be happy in my old age. When Lewis Leakey told Jane her study might last 10 years, it sounded like a lifetime, and privately she thought three years at most. Already into her third decade at Gumby, the pioneer who dared to be accepted by wild animals and won has no intention of leaving now. Mm-hmm.